Huh? You timed with me? <sighs> Would you like to sing this morning? Yeah. this morning because there was a rip in a couple of places. I don't even know how that happened. So, uh, you may sit right here if you need. Wherever your hand is visible. Thank you. Still, you know. No, you'll be fine. Okay, so, are we good? Well, good morning, Solid Rock. No, we could do better than that. If I can do better. Hmm. Good morning, Solid Rock. Good morning. That's a little more like it. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yeah. It's good to have you here. It's good to be here. You're invited to stand to your feet if you like. You know this song. It's amazing love. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again we're gonna sing that one more time I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you are condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I sing amazing love how can it be amazing Amazing love, I know it's true, that it's my joy to honor you in all I do, to honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And I'm accepted, you are condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be? Amazing love, how can it be that you my king Amazing love, I know it's true 
joy to honor you in all I do. Before we move on to another song, I'd like to call Parker Coley to the front to open us in a word of prayer, please. Yeah. Won't come on up. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do, God. Just bless us all, Lord, and forgive us for all of our sins, Lord, and thank you for this wonderful day that we have, Lord, to come here and worship you, Lord, and read your word, Lord, and understand your word. And thank you, Lord, and forgive us for all of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, I have one more if you want to sing. We're going to sing song number nine in our praise books. But that's if you want to stay where you are and not shake hands with somebody else. That's up to you. Okay. Song number nine, the song is called Hallelujah, Praise His Name. Thank you for singing with us. Leela, thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's so good to see everyone here this morning and those tuning in. God bless you. As you pray for those that are feeling well this morning and those that are traveling as well. Look at your neighbor, tell him you're glad to see him, in case you didn't get to do that a minute ago. Amen. That's right. Amen. I'm so glad to see him. 
Thank you, Brother Parker, for opening us in prayer as well. And uh, at this time, I have our deacons come forward for our morning tithes and offerings, please. This time. And I don't know where the other mic is. <laughs> is it on the piano? Nope. Here you go. <laughs> you have to cut it back on, cut the bottom button off. Thank you. you. Push the bottom button. I kept trying to just <laughs> hold it down till it turns green. Yeah, hold it until it turns green. I'm sorry. Yes. There you go. Amen. Working. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead, gentlemen. Father God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for everything that you do for us, Lord. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross, Lord, for our sins, Lord, and for all the great things that you do for us and all the miracles that you bless us with, Lord, and just bless us all, Lord, and forgive us for all of our sins. We love you, Lord, and praise you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. And They've all rise for their dedication by tithes and offerings. Father God, thank you to, for this day, Father, to give us your open house to come hear your word, Father. In this other living world that we're living in right now, we thank you that you're with us always, keeping, guiding, safe everyone home to their comings and goings. And may everything we do here today be for your glory and your honor. We ask all this in your holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> we have two this morning. First, I'm going to introduce uh, Ms. Dr. Candice Phelps and then Dr. Nicholas Marika. I'm thinking last name. <laughs> and uh, doing exhortations to the church. So I know you'll be blessed with what they have on their heart to share. Come on up, Miss Candy. Get you get to go oh. first. That's okay with you. Cool. Um, if you have your Bibles, find Romans chapter 5. I won't keep you there long. Now, I, I read the Bible every day. That, that is not a brag, okay? Just listen list to what comes next. I, I read the Bible every single day, at least a chapter a day, have for many, many years. And yet still, I have to remind myself that the wicked, that the various authors describe, accuse, condemn, etc., is just as likely to be me as it is the people that first come to mind when I read about what will happen to them. I think of crooked politicians, we all do, uh, people who have wronged me or those close to me, evil figures throughout history, people we all consider wicked. If I say a wicked person, there's automatically someone that comes to your mind, right? And, and that's normal. But without Jesus, without his righteousness, I need to remember that the wicked whom the scriptures warn and condemn is me. I'm wicked. I'm sinful. I'm capable of evil and have done evil. We all have. That's the point I'm trying to make here. I'm not beating myself up. It's not what this is about. Um, it's just the truth. That's all. It's about all of us. But I find comfort in the scriptures because it gives a way out for the wicked and speaks just as often as of how the wicked can become the righteous, how we aren't left to the condemnation that we bring on ourselves because we are all wicked. No, the Bible isn't condemning 
anyone. It's a notice of a way out of the damnation waiting for everyone that doesn't want to be righteous. Romans 5, verses 6 through 11, it says, For when we were, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for who? For the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Maybe for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement or the the payment, the covering for our wickedness, for our sin. There never has been, never will be a way that we can save ourselves. When mankind was in no position to fix their situation, when we had all become wicked, Along has come a Savior that has the answer, still does, always has, to our emptiness, our evil, our ignorance, our hate, our all-around human condition. That Savior is Jesus, and he knows you, and he loves you just as you are, despite your, our, many, many imperfections. And he thinks enough of you to choose to be the payment for your sin. After all we've done to push him away, he chose to die. Something he would never have to experience. All in an effort to get back to you and me. As sinners, we separate ourselves from him, but his love still remains. And he wants to have you back no matter what you may have done. We aren't perfect, but we aren't wicked anymore. When we, when we know Jesus and follow him, we aren't condemned, nor are we hopeless. Thank you. Candy and I talk from time to time, and I'll call, you know, I'll call her up or I'll, we'll discuss biblical things. I'm usually seeking knowledge from her, because Candy's kind of our walking biblical encyclopedia. Yeah, you can give her a hand. And when Dave asked me to do that, there's several of us that are going to do that. So it's not just us two. There's a bunch of us that are evidently going to be included in this, uh, in this exercise. But um, Candy and I had not talked about this at all. But Dave, when we used to do round robin, Dave and I used to talk about how, and anybody else who did round robin, we would talk about how the messages that God would put on her heart would be aligned with the sermon. And this would happen all the time without even talking about it. And Kathy discussed, Kathy, Candy discussed the, the topic of wicked, being wicked, wickedness. And that's, we're going to connect that in just a minute at the end of this. Um, You know, as a therapist, one of the things we emphasize is that, especially when you go to grad school, they emphasize the idea of being self-aware because you gotta know what's wrong with you that you're working on before you help other people. And, you know, for me, self-awareness, and I'm not, everybody in this room is typically very self-aware of the idea for, of 
self-awareness. I am always aware that I am a husband. I am always aware I am a father. I am always aware I have a job. I'm always aware I have responsibilities. But I'm not always aware I have a, that I am a Christian. Not all the time. And I'm not exceptional, unfortunately. I've heard the word wicked used to defined as the refusal to worship. And I don't know that it's so much the refusal to worship as it is the absence of worship. And I want to talk about that for just a couple of minutes here. I want to talk about a topic that in therapeutic circles, instead of calling it awareness, we call it mindfulness. And I want to talk about godly or Christian mindfulness. The idea that you're all much like you're, if you're a husband, a father, a wife, a daughter, a son, a brother, whatever you are, these are things that are aware, but are we always have Christian mindfulness? Are we always aware of that we have godly mindfulness? See, Christian or godly mindfulness is the practice of being aware of God's presence in your life all the time. Much like you would be aware that you're a husband or a wife or a father or a mother or a brother and a sister. Christian or godly mindfulness, we are to deliberately take on that idea that we are a Christian all the time. And we are to deliberately do it. On Wednesday nights, I've talked a lot about a guy by the name of Brother Lawrence. And Brother Lawrence, when he, and I researched this a little bit because I got intrigued as when he actually did this. And he was 16, and he was out in the forest looking at the trees. And he noticed that every, he noticed that every year, the trees would go dead, if you will, and then God, and then they would be, you know, all of a sudden they would spring back to life. And realizing that the tree would be in full leaf and flower in a few months, he saw the tree as a symbol of God's ability to transform the human heart. He saw it as a metaphor for that. And so he made, a, he made a commitment to himself that he would operate his life as if God was standing next to him every single minute of every single day. And that's the way he lived. And all he did was make a commitment. He wrote a book, The Practice of the Presence of God. It has sold millions of copies. This was a simple kitchen hand in the, the mid-1600s who wrote this. Yet he became a counselor to all kinds of people based on, because he lived this simple principle that we as Christians desperately need to take on. His book has influenced millions. He learned to live the godly Christian mindfulness as a daily continuous practice. Christian mindfulness, godly mindfulness. In Matthew 4, Jesus demonstrated the practice of godly mind, ma, ma, Christian mindfulness. When Jesus was tempted, he was fully aware of what was going on and who he was. And he didn't engage the devil. He just kept on rebuking him through the use of the word. Godly Christian mindfulness. Genesis 3. Eve demonstrated what happens when we don't practice godly Christian mindfulness. What did she do? 
Instead of being fully aware of God's presence, she remembered what God had commanded. We can't eat that. God said we're going to surely die. Satan says, you won't, you're not going to die. So what did she do? She looks at the shiny object. And she engages in this mental, mental argument with herself. And she says, well, it looks good to eat. So she looks at the shiny object and forgets who she is. And forgets who she is as a God, in her godly Christian mindfulness, she forgot. And we're going to talk about what that has to do with worship in just a second. So instead of, by thinking about what the shiny object could do for you, for her, instead of what God could do for her. And that's every single one of us looking at the shiny object and forgetting basically who we are. You know, Peter said, we've been given everything we need to live a life of godliness. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through this he has given us, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through him you may participate in the divine nature. But we have to, ex we have to pursue and exercise godly Christian mindfulness because we have this thing called a sin nature. And it's all too easy in our pride to st say, I'm going to look at the shiny object and I'm going to do it my way which is what God is in the uh, predicament we're in today. We are to train yourself to be godly. 1 Timothy 4, 7. We are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. We are to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight don't be wise in your own eyes fear the lord and shun evil good advice godly christian mindfulness when it comes right down to it if you really want to make this simple for yourself, instead of going through major theological exercises, because you don't have to, Candy concentrated on the word wicked. And I said I had defined it as the refusal to worship God. But for us, she pointed out how we're all weak, wicked because of the sin nature. Many times, a lot of times, it's the absence of the worship of God because we forget who we are. We're not practicing godly Christian mindfulness. Christian godly mindfulness is really nothing more than worship. 24 by 7 by 365. And it has to be practiced because of our sin nature. We're not used to it. So that you never, ever lose sight of God in your life. Learn to practice Christian mindfulness. Let God transform you by the renewing of your mind so that you are participating in worship of him all the time. Once you get, it, you get into that habit, and the peace, and you enter God's rest. Thank you. Amen. Outstanding, amen. That goes along with our Sunday school lesson this morning as well. Amen. Thank you very much. This time I have Brother Joshua and Janelle come up for our scripture reading at this time. Make sure you get a bulletin, look at it. Got some birthdays even today, uh, this month. So amen. R birthday to you all. Good morning, brother. Good morning, folks. 
if y'all would like to stand. Today we're going to be in James chapter 4. Our sweet sister Dawn got me an NLT Bible. I'm very thankful. I'm going to start with a word of prayer. Holy Father, thank you for letting us all be here. Thank you for your salvation, for your spirit, for your word that we can turn to. Thank you for giving us the still small voice to listen to when we calm ourselves and we can align ourselves humbly with you. Thank you for gently humbling us in this crazy world. I know everything could be so much worse. Thank you so much for letting us have this time of peace that we get to live in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. James chapter 4, drawing close to God. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires of war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you do not ask. You don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gave us grace generously, as the scripture says. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone, who gave the law, is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Look here. You who say, today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town, and we will stay there a year. We will, have, we will do business there and we'll make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It's there for a little while and then it's gone. We, what you ought to say, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's the word today. Thank you all. All right. Sister Caitlin, back there in the back, part of my youth. I think they're dismissed upstairs, right? Yes. Are you? Nine and under. Meet her in the back. Amen. Let's <laughs> go upstairs. Amen. Thank you. Take her on up. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> All right. Who is 
is this king who judges with mercy, runs to the hurting and rescues the lost. Looks at the sinner through a heart of forgiveness with arms open wide on a cross. If what I've heard is true of you, then how can I stand in your presence if what I've heard is true? of you then I'll stay in this moment forever what can I give you that you can't make better all of my ashes you've turned into gold you are the giver you are the treasure a glory too great to behold if what I've heard is true of you then how could I stand in your presence if what I've heard is true of you then I'll stay in this moment forever if what I've heard is true of you then there's not enough words to describe you if what I've heard is true of you my Jesus, there's nobody like you, and I'm so in awe, and I'm so in awe of you, Jesus, I'm so in awe, I'm so in awe of you, and I'm so in awe, and I'm so Jesus, I'm so in awe, and I'm so in awe of you. Who is this Savior with a love like no other? The skies can't contain and the grave couldn't hold. Cause all of my worship has just scratched the surface and I've got forever to go. If what I've heard is true of you, then how could I stand in your presence? If what I've heard is true of you, then I'll stay in this moment forever. If what I've heard is true of you, then there's not enough words to describe you if what I've heard is true of you. My Jesus, there's nobody like you, and I'm so in awe, and I'm so in awe of you. Jesus, I'm so in awe, and I'm so I'm so in awe, and I'm so in awe of you, Jesus, I'm so in awe, and I'm so in awe of you. Thank you, church. We're going to be looking in Philippians chapter 3 here in a minute or two. I was looking at the very first verse here that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and it dawned on me that if everybody in here understood what I said each time I said it, we could just hold a month's worth of meetings, and you wouldn't have to ever come back to church no more. You got it all. You're done. But many of y'all are like me, hard-headed. You're welcome. And sometimes I only get little bits and pieces of it at a time. And so it takes a while for a lot of us. Sometimes it's a lifetime, and I'm one of those. Paul here, writing to the church at Philippi, and he's talking to them about walking closer to the Lord. 
And believe me, that's something that I've been saved 57, no, 55 years. By, I'm not going to end it with a by cracky. I promise not to, so y'all won't laugh at me. But I am nowhere near getting it all. Never will be. If I live to be 100, still going to be learning something new, so don't, don't kick yourself. Paul says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And he said, to write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So he's gone over this many times with the church at Philippi, but they needed to get it in writing this time in order for it to kind of sink in. And here Paul admonishes people to rejoice in the Lord, and that means regardless of your circumstances, and that is real hard to do. But it is the right thing, and it's what we need to learn. So many people... And I see them all the time. They let their joy depend on their environment. And if you do that, you will very rarely experience true joy. Joy is something you can have in the midst of all kinds of troubles. And so he said, rejoice in the Lord. And then he gives them a warning. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. What he's doing is lumping all three of those groups, those people together as one group. He calls a group of people, and I'll tell you what they're doing in a moment, but he gives, he calls, they're, they're a bunch of dogs, they're a bunch of evil workers, they're, they're of the concision. And what he's saying is, Dogs, evil workers, and mutilators is what concision is. And that group of people are the Judaizers, the legalists. Now, he uses the word dogs because, and I, I was, it's, the Hebrew word is kevelim, if that means anything to you. And I thought it was going to be some deep meaning, and I looked up kevelim, and it says dogs. What it is, though, is under ancient Hebrew reckoning, they, had a, they used that term to refer to something that was vicious or whatever. And I, I did a little bit more studying on there because, you know, everybody has a dog or has had a dog, and they're the greatest, most loyal pets in the world. And even later on, the Hebrews acknowledged that, the late, later on Hebrews. But the earlier ones had used that as a derogatory term and I found out why. The ancient Hebrews believed that the barking of a dog could cause a miscarriage. Now, that's not true with most, most dogs, but it is true with Jim's dogs. <laughs> I told Don I was going to get you this morning. They came exploding out into the hallway this morning, and I like to have a heart attack. I didn't know what that was. Blah, 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 blah. You know, and I was great. That was taking the key going in my apartment. I'm still shaking a little bit from that. But anyway, what he's doing is Paul is referring to those who believe that circumcision is essential for salvation. He called them mutilators. Man, that was a big deal for a Jew to make that kind of a statement. That man, he was really treading on thin ice with the rest of the Jewish population. And believe me, though, that group is still around. And they are in just about every church. I've been in a lot of churches over the years. I've, I've pastored some. I've assistant pastored in some. I've been a youth pastor in some. Can you trust me to be a youth pastor? Can you believe that? No wonder the kids are so messed up nowadays. <laughs> what it is is they teach denominational beliefs. Go on the website of just about every church and they will tell you what verses in the Bible they recognize. That burns me up. You better recognize all of them. What we recognize. You reckon God worries about what you recognize? And, and what they, they teach denominational beliefs and personal convictions. Now, the Bible says you have your own personal convictions, and if you violate your personal convictions, that is sin to you. 
but it may not be to someone else. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But they teach denominational beliefs and personal convictions as scriptures from God himself. And if you do not measure up, you are less than spiritual. You are looked down upon. And I've seen it in every denomination that I have ever visited or been a part of. Do this. Don't do that. Wear this. Don't wear that. Your hair is too short or your hair is too long. On and on and on. What they're doing is inserting works into the Christian faith. The word of, and, and, and that it's all of that's fine, but here's some works now you got to do. Now, the word of God and the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus is all good, they'll tell you. And I've actually had them come up to me and tell me, oh, that's all good. But now here are the hoops that you need to jump through if you're going to keep it. And, and some believe they can earn salvation. Some people believe they have to hang on to it. And you go into one church and they'll holler, turn loose. You go to another one, they holler, hang on. You don't know what to believe. It's what you need to believe right here. And, and for the legalist, it will never be enough. You jump through that hoop, they got another one for you. As a result, many believers feel they are less spiritual than others, that they don't measure up to either man nor the Lord, and they're never able to accomplish anything for the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about sin. There's thing, the Bible clearly tells us what sin is, and that always will bring you down and cause you problems and keep you from the Lord's best. That's a given. But I've, I've seen people, one person said he heard a song in his church that didn't sound quite right because it was a little bit too rocky, and so he walked out. Probably missed out on a really great service. Did y'all know that the old hymns were written according to the popular tunes of the day? Some of them were bar tunes. Thank you, Candy. You're right. And, you know, I, I, seriously, and I love the old hymns. Don't get me wrong. And they're great and they're spiritual. But you got to stop looking down your nose at all forms of music that don't sound like that. Because back, did you know that the Salvation Army, when they were first founded over in England, were stoned to death in the streets for playing modern music? And the founder, General Booth, said, why should the devil have all the good tunes? I like his way of looking at it. I've, I knew a man down in South Carolina was a pastor of a church. Big church took a year off from his ministry to go write a book on the evils of women wearing pants. I hate to tell him this, but there were no pants on anybody at the time that he was referring to where it said that it was a shame or a sin or abomination or whatever for a man to wear a, a woman's clothes or a woman to wear a man. There were no pants. Nobody had pants. They all had robes. And the only way you could tell a man from a woman on the street because they were all covered up was the border on the bottom of their robe and the Wannabe transgenders would swap it out, and that's why God said that's an abomination, and it still is. But it was nothing to do with that. And he took a year off out of ignorance. Mm. Y'all remember my hair, and I can still grow hair now. Take that. I better stop that. God will fix me. I'll have a big ball spot about a year from now, right in the top of my head. On occasion, I'll wear my hair long. Is it to make a statement or am I just too trifling to go get it cut? I don't know. I'm not really sure. But I remember we had some family. We put a big billboard up out in 29 one time about coming to this church. Well, there comes this couple that sits right back there where Russell's at. 
Man, they looked like they stepped out of the band box. They had all the finest clothes on, and they saw me coming down the aisle with that long hair, and they looked at me kind of funny, but they didn't say nothing. Then when they found out I was the pastor, they couldn't wait for everybody to bow their heads at the altar, and they got down and ducked out like they were under fire from a rifle. They were ducking down, headed for the door. Man, they missed a great service. Just as well, we wouldn't have done too great anyway. Paul says, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Circumcision was originally ordered by God to the Jews only to show you belong to the Lord. But now the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the new circumcision available to everybody who is saved, and that is our badge of salvation. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. Our worship of God is not with sacrifices and burnt offerings and rituals. You know, man is incurably religious. They love that stuff. No, our worship is with our spirit and in truth, yeah. not in the outward appearances. I will say this this morning. I do not care what you look like. You are welcome. Amen. We'll worry. Let, let God will take care of all of that. With what, if you think you don't look right, God will tell you that he don't think you look right, and you can go correct that. But we love you, and you're welcome. Number three here is the part that is a real problem. The toughest thing that a human being can do is to let go of the flesh. Paul says we have no confidence in the flesh. Toughest thing that a human being can do is let go of that flesh. We are to have no confidence whatsoever in the flesh. Your accomplishments, your degrees, your awards, your possessions, your following or whatever it is, it, it, it's all got to go as far as having something to lean on. We, we cannot lean on our own merits. If we do, we're in great trouble. In lieu of following Christ and humbling yourselves before him, tough thing for human beings to do. But I will let you know this much as a litmus test, if anybody knows what a litmus test is. People with real spiritual gifts don't get on TV and make a circus out of it. Strutting around the stage like Ric Flair and bringing attention to themselves. If anybody don't know who Ric Flair is, see me after the service and I'll do an imitation of him for you. That's right. As a matter of fact, the most credentialed man of his time who was Paul? His list of degrees and accomplishment looked like a receipt from CVS. He tells it this way. He said, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, but if any man thinks that he has whereof he could trust in the flesh, I have more. He said, you want to compare brain pans? You want to compare accomplishments and degrees and all of that? Paul, Paul says, you want to do things in the flesh? All right, fine, let's compare. He said, circumcised the eighth day. That was the perfect day for a Hebrew boy to be circumcised was the eighth day. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, all the right things. And if you were to ask a, the, the normal Orthodox Jews back then, and give them a list of Paul's accomplishments, they think that he's one of the greatest of all of them. All, all the right pedigrees. I always think of uh, Gilligan's Island when Thurston Howell III would go, oh, he must be a Harvard man. I don't know if any of y'all remember that. Lord, that really makes me feel so old. <laughs> or he'd tell them they acted like a Harvard man or a Yale man or whatever. Whatever it is that they do. All of the right everything, the best family ties, the best religious political party, and that's what there were. There were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. 
He had the best education. He sat under the most highly respected Jewish teacher of all times, Gamaliel. He was the most respected in his day of all the teachers. Then he said this, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. And under Orthodox Judaism, that was a good thing. As touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. Here Paul declares that he was blameless before the people as they looked upon him as one who had upheld all 613 Levitical laws. I broke a bunch of them when I had a sausage biscuit this morning <laughs> and started my car. But you know what? Paul didn't rest on that. He later declared himself a wretch because of the inner struggles that he had. Paul never rested on his pedigree. Then he makes this statement, which is another shock to the church at Philippi. For what things were gained to me after he listed all of these things and had the people all in awe of him, he said, I counted it all loss for Christ. And just like Paul, that's the way we are to do. John the Baptist was not playing when he said of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. And Jesus had just said there was not a greater prophet ever walked this earth than John the Baptist. But John the Baptist had a different way of looking at it. He needs to be glorified and I need to get out of the way. And that's what we need to do is not boast on what we have and what we are and what we have accomplished. We need to get out of the way and let people see Christ. And you need to realize how undone we all are without him. Then he said, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Paul gave up everything he had for the ministry of the gospel. How many people could say that they would be even willing to do that? And there was never a greater church planner on this earth than the Apostle Paul, who had just previously been the greatest persecutor of all the churches when he got saved. God wants each of us in here to no longer depend on our merits. Don't even look at them. He wants you to totally depend on him. Then he says this in verse 8, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Here's a scary part. The Bible says if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom of God. Mm. But they did it all right, didn't they? They obeyed all those laws. It's, then it says, without holiness, we shall not see God. But what you've got to understand, it is not our righteousness, and it is not our holiness. The Bible said all of our righteousness and before God looks like filthy rags. It must be his righteousness and his holiness that we must completely trust in to get us into the kingdom of God, not ours. Man's heart, I heard somebody say, trust your heart. Oh, you're going to hell, you trust your heart. That old heart is still desperately wicked and has all kinds of imaginations. Don't trust that. Then he says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. Paul knew Christ, but what he was saying was he wanted to know him better. So if that's, that's your desire this morning, there are a couple of things, maybe three things that you really ought to do. First of all, make much 
of the book that tells about him. It's often said if you study botany, you'll learn about the flowers. If you study astronomy, you'll learn about the stars. If you study geology, you'll learn about the rocks. But if you study this right here, you'll learn all about the lily of the valley, the bright in the morning star. You won't know so much about the age of the rocks, but you'll know all about the rock of ages. Let me say this. I see these pseudo-intellectuals. They'll get on social media, and they'll go, I believe in the word of God, and I'm a Christian, but I also believe the earth is billions of years old, and you are an idiot. That's what the evolutionist claims, but they can't back it up. They can't prove it. If you want to find out about the age of everything and how you got here, read this right here. It's never changed, and I'm going to say this. If you can't trust this to tell you how you got here, then you sure, Lord, can't trust it to tell you where you're going. You can't have one and then the other. you got to have them both. Either you believe it or you don't. Don't be afraid to back the Bible because it is real science, and they're finding out now more and more and more just how real it really is. Always be careful of where your Bible came from. Who, who's doing the translating? Let me warn you ahead of time of two infidels by the name of Westcott and Hort that are responsible for a lot of the modern translations and now Bible scholars are digging deep into what Westcott and Hort taught and finding out most of it was a lie that they were on a rampage to discredit the word of God in truth. Be very, very careful. They did not believe that the Textus Receptus was valid. They called it villainous and vile. They did not believe in the deity of Christ. They did not believe that heaven existed except only in the mind of man. And they believed, these, these two men believed in talking to the dead, and they were also followers of Charles Darwin. A lot of people don't know that about them. They died unsaved. They were not saved, and I'm going to tell you why they weren't saved. Jesus said in John chapter 8, if you don't believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Jesus is the I am of Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, the voice of God in the burning bush when Moses said, what is your name? He said, my name is I am. Jesus is the I am. There was no misunderstanding. And then he said in John, it was John chapter 8 verse 24, if you don't believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. And then in John chapter 8 and verse 58, well, before that he told him, he said, Abraham saw me. And he rejoiced to see me. And they said, you're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. He said, truly I say unto you before, Abraham was, I am. I am. You can't be saved and not believe that Je either Jesus is God or he's not. You can't get saved believing that Jesus is not God. The Jehovah's Witnesses have a book they publish. I got their whole library. I've led a bunch of them to the Lord over the years. And one of their books said Jesus is not God. They don't believe. They believe he was a created being. And at one time he was Michael the archangel. You can't be saved and believe that. Either you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, or you are lost. Period. So make much of the book that talks about him. The next thing is you need to constitute the habit of secret prayer. There's enough public prayers prayed to save the world, but it's the private prayers, the prayer closet prayers that get the job done. Yeah. Moses, in seclusion, prayed, and when he came back out, his face was literally glowing. I know a lot of people that prayed for me in private, and God blessed me publicly and helped me publicly because of it. Get alone in your prayer closet and talk to God and tell him what's really on your heart and what's really on your mind. He will listen to you. 
You know, when we get, there's nothing wrong with a public prayer, but you know what? When we get up behind a microphone, we ain't going to tell God what we've done this week where everybody's listening. We're not. If anybody wants to, come on, we'll sit back and listen to it. If they pull the screen down and played back their thoughts from this last week, there would be nobody left in here at the end of the service to turn the lights off, but may, maybe candy. I don't, I don't know. Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan. And Jonathan can get the upstairs air conditioner, turn, a heat turned off, candy can get the other ones, and they could leave the church alone. <laughs> no, when you get in your prayer closet, you, that's when you get honest with God. When you get alone with him. Constitute the habit of secret prayer. And finally, be busy telling others about him. There's no excuse for any of us now with all them tracks that Peter's got back there on that back table. They're some of the best witnessing materials you have ever read in your life. And everybody can tell somebody else what Jesus did for them. Uh, uh, the blind man, he didn't know anything about theology, eschatology, any of the ologies, all he, can, all he could say is, all I know is where I, whereas I was blind, I can see now. Wow. And that's a good enough testimony. The woman at the well, she said, come see somebody that told me everything I ever did. And a lot of people accepted Christ because she did that. All through the Bible, people that didn't know anything hardly went and told others about Jesus. You bring them to Jesus and he'll take care of that. But everybody needs to have a testimony of what Jesus did for you. And if you don't have that testimony, we're going to give you a chance in a minute to come and get one where you can walk out of here and tell everyone what Jesus did for you this Sunday. Shall we stand? It should be the desire of everybody here to get to know Christ better. It also should be the desire of everyone here to get to know Christ if you've never actually done that. If you've never actually trusted him for your salvation. This is the time you should come and trust him for that. Maybe you have another need. I'm telling you God is able with whatever is going on in your life. He is able. So if you would, when Candy sings a song, if you have a need, come take one of these folks by the hand. Let them pray with you. If you've never been saved, don't you dare be embarrassed and be ashamed. You come on down here and tell them, I ain't never been saved before. I'd like to be saved. They'll pray with you and show you from the Bible what you need to know about being a child of God. It's so simple a child can understand. Doesn't make any difference. If the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart today, would you come as Candy sings? Christ the Lord worship
worship him. Still time if you need to come, folks. Come on. The Lord. Let's talk to the Lord about it this morning. Whatever's on your heart. Let us lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship him. Let us lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship him. Let us lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Brother Holmes, you have an announcement? I, I'm... Yeah, just a reminder that we have a meeting after the service today. Okay. Uh, and then you'll have a meeting. All right. Brother, if you would. Please be seated, everybody, for just a moment. I have a couple of announcements, and uh, and these are in in order of least importance. Okay, as I presented first, again, um, least importance. First, I would just like to mention that I uh, accepted candidacy to run for city council of Lynchburg, Virginia, and uh, that, not by choice. Uh, really, I. <laughs> As most of you know, I had said that I wanted to retire. Actually, I'm officially retiring this month, and I just wanted to spend a lot more time doing other things uh, than business activities, which demanded a great deal of my time. However, I was reached out by, by several people asked me if I would possibly do this. There was other candidates, but they wanted me. I was the foremost candidate that they wished, and, uh, and after prayerful consideration, and my wife and I thinking and praying about this, I accepted it. Um, I've been very fortunate and humbled to have the people that have, that have come forward and offered to help me. It, it's, it's remarkable to me. I had, my campaign manager has been U.S. Senator uh, Cruz's campaign manager, our congressman Bob Good's campaign manager. He's been involved in campaign management committees for state and local politicians and uh, my finance camp, uh, manager also has been involved with uh, national and state campaigns as well so I'm very fortunate and humbled to have these people there they're very adept very astute very, very very well versed in what they do and so I ask for your prayers for this um, the person I am running against uh, is another Republican who has been um, a disappointment, really, to be very frank. And I won't say any more about that um, And um, uh, to his constituents. Um, anyway, with that, let me just move on. Um, I am so grateful. I was thinking about how grateful I am to God. It was from Jim's class this morning to what the pastor mentioned, to the songs that we heard. I am so grateful to God that I was not rejected to where, where I was invited to go first to hear the gospel. The way I looked <laughs> and what was inside of me, I don't want to keep I'm having the pastor and, and Donna standing here, I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, and what was inside of me, folks, I think I was the worst person out of all the group that I hung with, and I knew hundreds of teenagers that we would hang with together. I'm grateful to God that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Yeah. 
And who did he hang out with? He didn't hang out with the religious crowd. They asked, why do you go with these people? Well, you know, he said to them, it's the, physi it's the sick that need the physicians. And I remember one time, pastor mentioned something about some preachers and churches. I remember I was, I was with my family. We were on vacation. We were dressed, and it was a, obviously it was a summer climate. And we went to church, not our, you know, dressy clothes, nothing like that I'm wearing now. You know, very, very casual and shorts, and we have two special needs kids, so we, you know, it was uh, very informal. And I remember we, and it was a Baptist church we went to. I won't say where right now. And it was on the beach, and, you know, people would dress their Sunday clothes. The pastor was in a suit and tie. And during the course of the message, he made a comment about <laughs> going to church and wearing your best clothing. And my wife dug her fingernails in my forearm because I was, I was, I was, she saw me starting to stand up. And, and I just, just let that one go. You know, God doesn't care what we, he, you know, we just need to come to him as we are. And just be real. Say, yeah, Lord, I need you. I need you. You're my everything. I, uh, I just want to mention one other, just a couple of things, and <clears throat> we'll close. Um, there is a, a man, and I will tell you why I say he's black. He's a black brother in Christ. His name is Vince Everett Ellison. I've met him and we, only a handful of times, but we've gotten to be friends, and we communicate by text. He is, he's written two books. Is a very astute in the scriptures, very astute in American history, and particularly very much involved in the black political movement in America. He's a brother in Christ, and he is very, <laughs> he's been on Tucker Carlson, he's spoken on Tucker Carlson, he's been invited this coming Sunday to speak at Memphis, Tennessee, at one of the largest black congregations in America with 12,500 membership in Memphis. The name of the church is World Overcomers Church. He spoke with the pastor and met them. They spoke briefly about topics, political topics, and of course, you know where he stands. He's right in line. He's solid, knows the Lord, on, on swerving in his faith and in his convictions. And he, and he votes in that regard. And he has been invited by this pastor and this huge congregation to share what he believes. Amen. That is, folks, that is huge. That, this, that the Lord has allowed this open door for him. Please pray for him. His name is Vince Everett Ellison. And finally, I would just like to mention, you know, today is the Stupor Bowl. So, I, uh, you know... We have people that spend thousands of dollars to go and travel and, go and spend also hundreds of dollars. They take up a lot of time. They go out of their way, you know, monetarily and, and, and take time away from the other activities in their life to go take care, to do this. Okay, look, I, and I, can, I get that as far as competing. I think there's no, there's no problem with that. My opinion, as far as athleticism, I was, however, it cannot become your golden calf, okay? Yeah. And, it, and to be honest with you, it did for me, and God had to get a hold of me, and I'm going to tell you really briefly what occurred. I had gotten swaying away from the Lord. 1999, I was involved in, in uh, martial arts. I was actually taking my two oldest sons and competing. We were competing around the country in martial arts. I mean, we had trophies from two feet to six feet tall. And my brother, his girlfriend, he was in black belt. His girlfriend was the world Shotokan Karate Championship three times and several times American champion. We hung out with world champion martial artists. I was invited to compete in St. Albans, West Virginia in 2099 for the national competitions, the sanctioned competition, Professional Karate Association, PKA, and I took bronze, I took third place, which allowed me to to try out for the U.S. Olympic team 
for the 2004 Olympic Games in Athens, Greece. Now, wouldn't that have been a kicker? A Greek-American competing against Greeks in Greece, okay? However, that, God saw how that was swaying me in the wrong direction. And I was sparring in Concord, Virginia at a friend's dojo, and I went at my opponent, and this is just a 2000, with a lunging back fist, and as I pushed up with my left leg, my, I tore my meniscus. The meniscus is a small ligament, but it brought me down, and I, and I said, okay, God, I, I realized God was trying to get my attention, and after that, I gave that up. And I just say that to say this to you, my brother. Is there something in your lives? What is it in our lives that actually sways us away? Okay. The Lord had to get my attention with that and get away with that and completely divert me away from that. So, and with the, with the Super Bowl, you know, they're expecting over 60,000 people in this arena, and they're all going to be cheering like, like fanatics, many of them are. You know, how much more should we be involved in bringing people to Christ and witnessing to them. What kind of fanaticism should we have in our lives to see people reach before they die and spend an eternity separated from God? When I got saved, I couldn't contain myself. I, I had to talk about Jesus everywhere I went. I literally, people didn't know what to make with me. They didn't know what happened to me. But I was glad to share it with them. The Bible says in Luke 15, 7, there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Yep. I just want to read one verse of scripture before we close. And this is in Hebrews 12. First two verses. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfection of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Let us go forth with joy. Everything that we heard today, and please be mindful. The Lord spoke to you this morning as we go away from here. Be mindful of that. Remember that. And let God minister to you. Brother Mike, would you please close us and dismiss us, brother?